leave myself in your hands. <laughs> there you go. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Big Board. As you can see, I am outside in sunny Austin today. Uh, we won't explain why. It's a complicated story. But uh, I, I'm enjoying the outdoors, and I've got Chris Fawcett with me here today. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you doing, Kip? And so Chris and I are going to do a designer deep dive, and we're going to dig into his latest design uh, that from Compass Games, and we'll talk about the title and its its history and legacy and all that in just a sec. But I'm super excited to have you on board. Where now? Actually, where are you? Where are you located? Are you, are you in in Illinois? St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, St. Louis. Okay. We, we, need get, we need to get you uh, into one of those gaming groups uh, that are local there to play some games. I, I've been up to St. Louis a couple of times to play, actually. Nice I, part uh, of the world. I, I, I think I know most of the guys, uh, gamers in the area. We get together when we can, but it's a little bit difficult now. Yes, yes. So uh, do you know Mitch Land? I absolutely. absolutely. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry that you know him. <laughs> I, don't, I don't take it too much as a as as an issue. I don't see him that often. I, <laughs> right. Right. I just ran into I just ran into him not too long ago, and we chatted yeah. for a little bit, uh, uh, doing yeah. some other some sideline work for him to help out with some some of the stuff that he's working on. I'll Perfect. let yeah. I'll let him be the uh, the, the judge voice of that. Bo gets released and talking more about that but uh, sure, sure. He's, got a lot of, he's got a lot of cool stuff coming up i think yeah, yeah. that's so, always a good wonderful. angle for, for some good stuff well let's talk about to brook mm -hmm. sure so, okay so so in this in this uh sort of format chris we we like to go back to the very beginning of the game design for you and what what gave you the idea uh, and we we know that frank chadwick had uh, a and I, I actually went online trying to find more details about that 1975 release of Chad Wicks and was looking for digital copy of the rules. Couldn't, couldn't uh, it, grab, grab it. It's a fairly obscure title. Yeah. Um, because I, I, it, was, it was not published by Game Designers Workshop. It was published right. by Conflict Games, which was for a while a kind of an imprint of GDWs. They... Um, and I think I think that came out of John Hill's uh, Conflict Games Company was where John Hill got his first publication stuff, uh, things he got published under his name. And I think um, that uh, the GDW folks picked up the rights to those games gotcha. because they did later publish them again. But uh, this follow to Brook wasn't one of John Hill's, but it got that Conflict Games imprint on it. And it's it's uh so it's it's probably a little bit more obscure because of that it's not even of a right. third world. it's a fourth world game company <laughs> right 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 and so what 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 was the original fascination for you with the fall of Tobruk, uh from from you know, frank's design and 75 was a really interesting time for game design anyway because it's it's just it's you know it's it's post russian campaign and um the uh I'm trying to think of the things that uh, I kind of harken back to that day that kind of struck me is just hex encounter and well, one to three to six to one odds and a D six. And then boom, a, a boom along comes GDW and uh, conflict and this, this particular title. And it was a lot more robust than that. So there, what drew you to that? Well, first of all, I think the timing is, was a big factor in that. I, this was, this was, I, I managed to buy a copy of this with my own money. Oh, yeah. All right. Thing to do. I mean, I'm talking about uh, maybe I was in junior high school. Maybe I was a freshman in high school. But it was a very, very long time ago. I didn't have much money. And, and the uh, $8.98 that was printed up in the corner was a heck of a lot of dough. Right. The, so, it, so it had some uh, sentimental, nostalgic value for me just because of that time when I was first getting into this hobby uh, on my own terms, not just, uh, you know, the very first war game I ever played was, um, you know, it was either Anzio, Battle of the Bulge, or Jutland, or, 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 or Waterloo, or something like that, but those were my brother's right. games. I was just playing his, 
this was one of the first half dozen games I ever bought with my own money for my own collection. Uh, and I played a, a lot of it. And um, it was it was a different game. The box was bigger than even the FCPI flat packs. It was just a strange thing. The 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 map was really thick, almost a card stock. It hmm. was glossy. The counters were big. It was just it, it just was a it, it was from a production standpoint. This was like wow. This is this is neat. You know, big Panzer Blitz size hexes, big big Panzer Blitz size counters and all that. And the odd thing was that it used two D6 combat results table. Right. So, I mean, it's like, okay, this is different. And, and one thing that was strange about it was that when you did your move, you didn't have to move everybody before you could do combat. So I could move five, six guys, do combat, and then move five, six guys more to take the place of where they were. And then have some more combat, and then have some more guys moving. I it was still, you know, Germans go, or Axis go, I should say, and then sure. and Allies go. But it was within that there wasn't anything fixed. Sort so inter 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 interrelated phasing between each side. It's not like okay, let's move the entire German army, then let's move the entire U.S. or British right. army. Let's move things in little clumps here, and and so it was really neat to really interesting to play and kept a lot of interest even while playing it solitaire which i probably ended up doing most of my gaming solitaire even then um because you, know, you, you didn't know very many people at that time right you're, you're looking at the back of the back page of the general hoping to find someone nearby <laughs> that you could contact you know that that kind of era but uh that that was that was part of the original appeal was uh, the timing of it and when I when I bought it. But another part of it was some of these innovations that I've, I've alluded to, like this, this, it wasn't really an impulse system. Like we're familiar now, you draw a chit, move guys. All right, that that wasn't how this was structured, but more on that later because mm -hmm. that was that was what I wanted. I wanted to evolve that game to a little bit more modern sensibilities, which is, um, you know, that's one aspect of it. Um, changing this this impulse system but you could move a group of guys have a battle and then you you know you didn't have a big advance after combat artificial you had you need to have reserves nearby to exploit to exploit right play. so you had to do military principles to a greater degree than most any other game i've seen and i was just learning this whole military historical uh the, the, these aspects of the military art, if you will. I was a kid in high school, a kid in junior high. I wasn't a military history buff yet. So, but this is this is that formative period for me. So the the, the biggest draw was sin mentality. So I, I kind of kept coming back to this game, the battle in general. I I, I started to become eventually was a very well read in Gazala just because it was one of my favorite topics it was this this um you know mighty clash of tanks in the desert and uh um, either side could win but it was always seemed to be rommel doing the winning at that time so um not that i had you know i didn't have any kind of fascination with the germans or anything like that but right. It, right. you know the the myth of 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 or the legend of the, you know, a very successful general. Right. That goes up into, it kind of leads into your, your reading. Yeah, the whole Uber Alice, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's that's how that's how the game kind of stuck with me over the years. Gotcha. And, and so, <clears throat> so, so hang on one sec. So if I so if I look back on that, <clears throat> you're saying that uh, so it's kind of the user interface, the experience. Uh, interaction with the counters and the map it was it was markedly different from games of that time and then you've got the uh, the uniqueness of the gameplay mechanics were the things that sort of captured you were, were the things that you didn't I know probably a leading question but things you didn't like about the game per se that uh, that sort of you went ah gee I wish this was different or or did you didn't care back then you just played it the way it was 
Well, I think back then it was more or less to take it at face value. This this is it because I didn't know any better. I didn't know any differently that if if there were issues and technique right. or, or accuracy or you know uh, clarity of rules, it 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 didn't dawn on me too right. much at that time right. because I was young, I was impressionable, and I was impressed by just about everything I saw. It was cool. Uh, everything new was cool. Uh, you know, even, yes. Yes. even um, you know, some of the, I, I, th this is the time I start to buy a couple of SPI games for the, you know, and finding out about that. And, oh my gosh, they, they have a magazine you can get and they send you games in the mail. What? Or right, it's just starting to learn about things like that. And so very, very formative. Didn't really know that there was, <laughs> It needed to be addressed in the back of my mind. But right. as I played the game more and more, I started to realize there were some some limitations with it. You started to get exposed gotcha. to more games, you know, getting a little bit more older, sophisticated, more well read. Uh, so it just it was just an, uh, kind of a uh, an awareness kind of dawned on you that, oh, this is how you can figure out what games are really good. And which games aren't so good? You compare gotcha. them to other games, and uh, I started to compare uh, to other games and started realizing, yeah, it's pretty neat. It's different, but you know, there were some things that that uh, I wanted to do differently with it. The main driver was the order of battle for that game was. Uh, Something I, I tried to take a look at and make sure that the counters that I have were the most accurate order of battle possible. And it wasn't like the original game was so far off as to be unbelievable. It was actually pretty close because it was a historical battle. I just want to draw a quick parallel. That, that's the motivation that got me started on the Bar Lev project, too, was fixing the order of battle. Right, that, right. That, that order of battle was a lot further away from reality, though, than the Tobruk was. So, and, and the work that Frank had done towards doing the, the rules innovations and the order of battle research with it was something that was a very solid foundation to build off of. But it's still, yeah, I wanted to do that. I wanted to fix the order of battle. It's interesting with Frank's designs, I, and I am by no means an expert in his, I haven't played all of his games, but I've played several. and. I find that he had this tendency to look at the history and look at the situation and then just this magic, uh, maybe it's not magic, maybe it's a lot of hard work, but this magic just comes out that the rules map into the history and give you that sense of place and time and, and I don't want to say mechanic, uh, capability of the units and, and things like that like the, uh i'm trying to now i can't remember the name of the game dang it's east front small 1943 red army maybe i think it was called i can't remember not red army damn it anyway it, i played that game played one of one of his games and just went oh my gosh this is this is what was going on. If you read the history this is what was going on and he seems to do that with uh, a lot of his titles and the rules bring out the history yeah there's there's a good strong connection between the mechanics uh and the and the theme the historical yeah. flavor of his games and i think that's one of the reasons why i, I always kind of frank amongst my my favorite uh right. war, board war game designers um, and, and by the way i i've been in contact with with frank uh during this this project and he's got i've got his blessings on it here and he's He's oh, cool. He, cool. He, he liked the fact that oh you you still like playing this and well yeah <laughs> things differently he says wow tell me what you're going to do and he worked with me very closely on uh, some aspects of Bar Lev he shared with me some some draft for example he shared with me some draft uh, map rework stuff that he was thinking about some huh. stuff that he had he had worked on for a while and you know with an idea of let's make this bigger and you know bigger expanded game but here's here's what i would do differently on this map and he shared that with me and and, and i um i asked him to look over my order of battle stuff to uh, to see if there was any suggestions in these you know things like that and it's um so he's been um 
been an active partner in the design effort, but he has been uh, certainly a supporter and uh, kind of a uh, behind the scenes mentor throughout both. So I, right, I right. appreciate Jake's involvement, both as the original designer of these, and I need to acknowledge that he, you know, you don't get anywhere uh, as a designer in, in the, the war game design business now without standing on somebody else's shoulders. And, um, and, and Frank's got some pretty big, uh, big shoulders. He can allow a lot of folks to, to be climbing on, I think. But, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. Interesting. Very gracious, very gracious person. So. And well, that's he, cool. From this area, central Illinois, and, and uh, living here, I run into him quite a few times. Uh, conventions, local conventions, and what have you. Either way. So, um, so the the order of battle was one thing that I wanted to look at with the with the re reevaluation re of it, but mm -hmm. I wanted to dive into the game itself a little bit more. I thought well, this is still a '70s mentality as far mm -hmm. as how the, you know, I don't want to say the quality of the rules, but the the minimalist approach to the rules taken back then. I mean, we had three sheets of paper double-sided those were the entire uh rules for the game right that's no fascinating numbering, yeah no numbering no cross-referencing just a solid paragraph of text those are all the rules about minefields a solid paragraph of text that's everything about artillery um and there was no you know so the the sensibilities of our modern selves here uh would have demanded a little bit more uh sophistication in, in how the rules mm -hmm. were organized. And of course, organization uh, is often exposed as lack of clarity and things like that. So just writing the tighter rule set, I started to realize that some things I just really wanted to change. Well, one of the one of the changes was, it's neat to keep this, this little impulse movement. I, I can move a group of guys and I can have combat with them, then I can exploit with a different group of guys. I wanted to retain that, but I also wanted to put a little bit more chaos into the uh, turn order by saying, okay, instead of the Axis going with all of their stuff before the Allies can do anything, each turn's an entire day. Things are going to be mixed back and forth. If I have to read these narratives and make, the, make, make sense of them and translate them into how this game works, I'm going to need to have something different than the old I go. You go, yeah. Yeah. Um, I going with a few of my guys at a time. So uh, went with a with a traditional chip pull system based upon formations. So it goes in the cup, you draw out the chip, the activation marker gets to go, but it's still within that that operation. The player, the the, the owning player gets to decide, well, do I want to move some of my guys of this formation first? Do I want to maybe call in an airstrike somewhere? I'm going to move my my recon, uh, uh, my armored cars up to do a little bit of scouting in there and, you know, and see what's in that hex. And um, I can call in an artillery barrage to soften them up before I send in the tanks. All of this is possibility. And, uh, right. And, and does that and so when you when you execute some of those actions, mm -hmm. uh, that's obviously going to play an effect, have an effect upon the result of combat. And is that represented as uh, column shifts or DRMs or how how do you represent yeah. that? Or, or is there a counter that you put on and say, oh, well, I recon this guy. I'm, something's going to happen. What, what happens? How does that work? Well. I, I really departed from Frank's combat system. Gotcha. I, 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 I tried to reconcile the results with this new um, set of mechanics of, of the impulses and the um, design your own operations phase uh, mentality that I wanted to stick with. Um, and I, I, I really wanted to reflect a few things differently um, that I don't think get reflected, uh, uh, they get abstracted a lot more often than, than I think. And this is an attempt to peel back the onion layers a little bit and look inside to see mechanically how can we reflect the chaos of, of basically which, uh, what was uh, uh, pitting hardware against hardware 
and the um, you know the stubbornness of the desert fighting. You know, it, even right. the Italians who are who are often uh, given a lot of um, you know they're they're the butt of a lot of jokes. Uh, unfortunately, Italian military in World War II. Um, wasn't sure. seen as being uh, very, very capable, but uh, the Italian soldiers were incredibly brave, of course. Uh, they had crappy equipment that they had to fall upon. And sometimes they had political generals that were appointed uh, that didn't lead them to well, but the, the, the soldiers were certainly yep. at least as, uh, you know, if, if they were well-trained and well-led, they were going to hold their own very well. Um, but anyway, so I want to reflect a few things. I want to reflect morale. I wanted to reflect the hardware aspect and I wanted to reflect training. All three of those are actually come into what often just shows up as a single digit on a counter. You know, you've got the combat strength. It's a six and it reflects all these different things in some right. kind of beautiful way. I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to get back there and look at the mechanics of that and actually have a system where you see these pieces interact and then you're not just given a single value. So yes. you've, you've got different um, different aspects of uh, of a unit. You've got a training aspect. You've got a morale aspect, and you've got the rifles, the hardware aspect. So, so do you actually have uh, some counter art we could have a look at? I think you said you might have uh, things we could sneak peek at. Yeah, sure. So maybe you could, let's pop them up on the screen, and we can talk uh, about the counters and what they represent and. I'd be curious about the design aspect as well. So, like, what? Once we have a look, I'll ask a few questions. But let's uh, let's jump into that. All right, here we go. I think I'm sharing. Okay, let me just make it available, and let me try this way first. Oh, got to put it to the stream. There you go, Kevin. All right. Okay, All right. cool. So, Are talk. We... So, talk. Talk us through. Yeah, we're up. So, talk us through a couple of. Um, so uh, a couple of these units. And okay, so I just want to confirm we're we're actually looking at the counter sheet here. Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, this is the front. This is a uh, the, the game. By the way, is uh, this is the print ready artwork. This is the file that the printer is going to get. So we're this is final production quality awesome. artwork. This isn't playtest stuff. Just by the way, um, but it holds very well to a. a you know, the, the, my design, my original design goals with doing the counters. Uh, Shane, you can see over Shane Logan, who is, yes. is also known for old school tactical and what have you, um, has and does, does his own artwork for his games. He's done a fantastic job on the artwork here. So just a few things here. And we're, we don't see the, the registration lines on this because, uh, you know, the, the file that's going to the printer isn't going to have that. Uh, they would just show up. You know, the, the cut lines are there. Um, but anyway, so just just highlighting a, a piece here. I'm going to focus in on the uh, the the tanks with the yellow stripes here. You might be able to recognize uh, right about in the middle of the screen. There's a, there's three Matildas sitting there in a row. This is part of the first Army Tank Brigade, the 42nd Royal Tank Regiment. The uh, the piece. The, uh, the anatomy of the pieces here, up at the top, we've got uh, a numbered letter combination inside a colored box. As you can see, there are black colored boxes, there are kind of a greenish gray colored boxes, and there are white colored boxes. Uh, yep. The color of the box represents the morale, the, uh, the training value of that particular unit. Uh, gray would be regulars. Uh, the greenish would be trained. They're, they're, I don't want to call them green because they did have training on it. So they have the least training. And then the white ones are the veterans, the ones that have been around in the desert for a while. Now, this particular screen doesn't show a lot of veterans. There's one, uh, one British unit there um, with dark, darker green. Are you seeing my mouse, too? Uh, yes. Okay. So I just hope Actually. you're going to that. Go ahead. I was just kind of curious if you were able to see that. But uh, so we've got we've got morale, uh, training. I'm sorry, and the, the letter value uh, after that number in the box represents the actual morale value of that unit, which can change over the course of the battle. 
uh, trading level is not going to change, but morale can change. So there, there is a morale effects on the combat system. Then the number value indicates the stacking value. It's basically equivalent to a company uh, or, or a troop, depending on you know the the the, the language of that particular type of unit. Uh, so we've got uh, all the armored units are down to uh, a company level, and that's the legacy of the original game. That's that's how uh, Frank had designed it. Battalions for infantry and artillery and companies for tanks. But a lot of the other units were kind of so set aside. They weren't really included like the flak units. Right, right. Well, another, another thing. Uh, Fell uh, from, from that perspective into. I'm sorry, Kev, go ahead. No, it's just going to, oh, looks like, wow. No, no, I'm watching our... Uh, Now sync here. I thought we lost out, lost out connect. Uh, what I was going to ask you was, uh, it, it seemed, it seems like the scale is different than scale, and yours is a, a, at a more granular level. And um, does that still play well with the company? Probably plays better with the company battalion level of of uh, of uh, units. Yeah. Uh, actually, this is this is a pretty pretty much adhering to the original scale. So the original game had had basically the same level of units as well. Um, Barlev, I've done some changes to, but in, in that regard, right. uh, no, I much kept what, what the units- but the, scale, maps, uh, but the map scales, the map scales different though, right? You're right. You're right. Um, well, it wasn't actually stated in the, in the, anywhere in the rules, what the true ah. map scale was, but- okay. We figured it was about six miles to a hex or so. It was, it was anyway, uh, when you calculated out what the ranges were for these various weapons that were supposed to be in, say, the artillery and what have you, the ranges were ridiculous. They, the, the, it didn't jive. The unit capabilities far exceeded their true capabilities when you compared it to the map that they were, they were fighting over. So I scaled it back. To um, I found that if I just halved the actual ground scale, the artillery units would align very well with the, their existing ranges for the most part. I still tweak them all, but right. they, they so the, these guys with the ranges of five out here, the twenty-five pounders, uh, generally speaking, and um, that's their actual range at the uh, at the the new map new scale. Right. But that's the same range they had with the old map scale, so things gotcha. were things were wonky there. So that was something I addressed, and right. I, I drew three separate maps at different times before I settled in on the current one, which was pretty much um, I found, and this the, I was able to work off of some 1930s and 40s maps, uh, U.S. map mapping service copies of british war department maps copies of italian maps that were captured gotcha so i mean going back pretty close to the source cool can you uh can you show us uh, some of the italians we have a request for uh, a viewer a uh, quick look at the italians if you have some absolutely give me a sec let's see counter sheet two i think is where the Italians show up. Let me zoom in. Now, um, I, I, I really wanted to focus in. I'm a big fan of making the, the, the counter colors based on uh, uniform colors. And I think mm -hmm. I nailed this one pretty well with the Italians. This is their, this is their, that color pretty close, I guess, of their, uh, right. of their, of their uniform. So here's some Italians. Now, um, I want to point out a couple of things. Now, one thing you'll notice is that their training is falls. You get a lot more units that are into that green gray, that that barely trained area. And that's not barely trained. It's just this is the best way to reflect their capabilities. Their morale mm -hmm. is still fairly decent. We get some. Uh, and by the way, the highest morale level in the game is a G. Um, 
So these Italians aren't too far. These are the Bersaglieri, the motorcycle troops. They're ease, but even their red, the line infantry, uh, for many cases, is, is a pretty good average. Some of the newer units that were just sent to that theater are, are coming in with a C. Uh, they're trained and their morale is a C, but some of them have, that have been around a little bit longer um, have Ds and even Es for their morale. And I mentioned that just because the, um, the Italians are often given, like I said, short shrift. And they, 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 they can stand up toe to toe fairly well if the fight is, is fairly even. But the Italians usually found themselves at a disadvantage either because of the lack of mobility or lack of leadership or just a reliance on totally crap, crappy right. equipment. <laughs> But yeah, hey, uh, so Chris, what, what, quick question: uh, what what is the um, what what is the counter size actually going to be? And I'm going to turn my camera off because I think I'm uh, I'm ch I'm chewing up bandwidth here, so I'm going to turn my camera off. But uh, but carry on and um, tell us a little bit about the counter size. Uh, did, you, did you sort of keep the historically large counters, or did we move to smaller ones? What happened? Five eighths, five eighths counters, nice and big. Nice, nice. Good. There's some small print on here, and you can see this is blown up, and, and still the unit identification text is kind of tiny. But the most important piece of information there is that big bright orange or green or pink or blue uh, unit, unit type symbol, and that's what ties you to the formations. So right. when you pull the orange formations activation marker, you move the orange guys. It's pretty straightforward, and it's easy to to map back to that. So you don't have to be hunting around for the 17XX tiny little print somewhere. That's just there for the uh, for the historical flavor. Very nice. And, and what about, uh, so you mentioned that there's a different map scale uh, and uh, also a more, perhaps a more accurate mapping. Uh, do you happen to have examples of that that we can have a look at? Sure, I have, I, I went ahead and pulled down opened up the map file. This is um, not the exact file that's going to the printer, but it's derived from it. Um, I'm going to zoom out here to see the whole map. Shane did a marvelous job of making it look like desert. Um, and, and really, this, this whole part of the, the world is, is, especially back then, it didn't get a lot of irrigation. So the brown is, is accurate. It really was about yeah. that. And um, the uh, the counters, they don't blend into the map and hide, mm -hmm. but they don't pop out. They're not garish colors either. They You can find them, but they don't jump out at you and, and you know, in, in a negative way. I think they look really good on this map. Um, the, the units, you know, the you've got uh, um, that um, ochre yellow Italian. You've got the khaki British and and flavors uh, variations of that for the other um, Empire Commonwealth uh, yep. nationalities. And the Germans are uh, kind of a sun faded gray green because they they kept with that same basic <laughs> color uh, until until the sun bleached it all out yeah what's the and so what's the scale on the on the map here what are we looking at how many uh clicks across oh kilometers why did you ask kilometers? oh miles miles is good i can do miles i'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an international guy chris <laughs> uh one and a half miles perhaps um nice. so the old okay. one was like three miles perhaps so that gives me enough so I can justify putting a uh, zone of control out there, but also have certain uh, unit types or stacks of units not have a zone of control. So there's a little bit of variability on, on zones of control in the game. It's not just I've got a guy, he's got a zone of control, and they, it acts like this. Uh, one of the, the things that I wanted to take into account is certain weapons would confer ability for a unit to influence the terrain around him, like the 88, for example. Well, so if there's an 88 in a hex, there's a heavy zone of control on all six hexes. And if you try to move adjacent to it, you're going to have to stop because you're going to get engaged by that 88. But yes. 
some of you, it's maybe a company or a couple of companies out there in the middle of a one and a half mile expanse, you know, um, whatever the square mileage is of a hex, they're not going to be able to influence, uh, greatly influence the terrain around them. So they might have no zone of control whatsoever. Or if there's just enough, they start to increase the mass of guys that put more stacking points in X. Yeah. You, you might be able to uh, get to a light zone of control, which costs movement points to enter. Gotcha. Or you can get a, you know, you get a whole bunch of guys and put them in one of these uh, defensive boxes that's out there. Uh, and you're going to have a heavy zone of control there because they're, you know, what guns yes. excited and, you know, a lot of guys and you get a whole brigade in there. If so, it's based upon the number of stacking points and to some degree, the type of weapon that's there. Right. Let's uh, zoom in on the map on the right hand side, just outside the Tobruk uh, uh, fortifications and there's a crossroads. Uh, there we go. LADM, I think it is. Yeah. So very nice. Give it a sec for the, uh, the yeah. my desktop. This this software is just going to take a while to, to write all the pixels here, but it's not going to be fuzzy, of course. Yeah, Eldadam. So the uh, here we can see there are four different types of transportation lines. Uh, coming off the right side is what is actually the rail line. That's the railhead at this time. It got out to this point, and uh, it went in a big old loop. You can still see the mm -hmm. of where that loop is. Uh, looking at uh, Google Maps or you know Google Earth. You still see it there. So there was a big supply depot there. Uh, they hadn't been able, the British hadn't extended it yet, uh, the rail line into Tobruk and beyond, which they did later. Um, but uh, the rail line in the pre, you know, previous six months hadn't even gotten uh, across the border. So this is where the rail line was here. And really, the only purpose of the rail line is to provide, is provide you with a source of supply. The, right. uh, the um, the gray line, uh, which is the line that runs throughout Adam and also the one that runs into King's Cross, the Via Balbia and the Ring Road listed on the map, these are the only hard surface roads in the whole area. Right. Right. Um, and then uh, just south of El Adam, just uh, off the lower, uh, just on the lower edge of the map, is a is a solid brown line, uh, the Tree Capuzo. As you can see the label of where we're on the right. That is a very well established track, caravan, yes. trail, what have you. Very easy to follow. Um, very, it's it's almost like the road, but not quite. And then you get these a uh, little bit more vague, dotted line trails that exist maybe as more of a concept in the, in the desert than an actual road. <laughs> but uh, this is where you might find milestone markers or. Uh, shrines to, you know, uh, you know, a Muslim tomb or something like that. It's this little crossroads is called CD something because, you know, and it's, it's uh, a, a vague uh, landmark reference to it. So yeah. Or track. You know, it's interesting. I was uh, uh, doing some reading uh, across the sort of the desert campaigns and when, when some of the British back in 41 first moved into the area, Oh, we had a lot of lot of um, feedback there. Uh, when they, when some of the British first moved into the area and were training and trying to work out how to move around in the terrain, they were losing wheels and axles and tires left, right, and center, and uh, and that um, that caused them no end of trouble. But after three months, they uh, had worked out how to how to navigate these tracks if you could see parentheses uh etc so uh it's pr pretty pretty amazing terrain that we're seeing here can we scroll over to uh, city uh regazi a little bit and i think i think you've got some echo going on with your uh, microphone uh chris we're getting a lot of background feedback in the well if necessary i'll put on a headset Are you still getting the feedback? That's better. It's a little, yeah, that's that's a little bit better. Yeah, because it was just a, there's a lot of sort of background echo. Okay, so, so let's zoom in a little bit around City Regazi. I noticed Knights Bridge looks like it's fortified as well. Is that fortifications yeah. there? 
Uh, it's a box. Um, a box. Not like a fortification, just. But it does provide. Uh, if you're in a if you're in a box, you get a heavily zone of control automatically, and it also does provide some benefit against uh, uh, indirect fire, because there was a lot of uh, underground construction bunkers and what have you. Guys were in slit trenches and all that. So um, artillery and air bombardment against boxes have a reduced effectiveness, generally speaking. Uh, in addition to that, I'm going to pull a little bit further to the east as we start to get into, this is the Gazala line. Mm -hmm. the, red, uh, mm -hmm. the red hex sites there, those are mined hex, uh, allied mines. The yes. X minefields, um, I, I, I did have a map that had those on there, but they were really not as extensive, and um, I pulled them off. But um, one thing you might see later, I, this is actually the first of a, of a two-game series using the same system and the other one is coming out it's called, it's called forgotten victory it's going to be the uh, crusader battles uh as well as brevity battle, battle acts and, and whatever else uh occurred in 1941. so this is that would be just the area just to the uh yep. east of where this map ends but the maps are going to meet up and if you have both games you can play the 41 campaign until it turns into 40 and there were access the the gazala line at the end of 1941 at the beginning of 1942 had a completely different context and connotation it was the germans and italians uh behind their minefields there was a little bit of uh, of, of a legacy of that but between between that those battles and these rommel had been chased all the way back to back to the he chased him out of Serenica. Uh, he'd come back up to this point, counterattacked, outflanked, and you know defeated the, the uh, British units that were left there, and got to this point here. Um, so this was this was the result of a successful Allied offensive pushing Rommel back on his supply lines, and then Rommel's counterattack bringing him to this point here. And then, then the logical conclusion of that counterattack was the attack to take Tobruk to secure his supply lines, something he wasn't able to do in 1941. So anyway. Right, right, right. Very cool, very cool. All right, uh, so, so um, is there anything else you want to show us on the map? Because I want to keep, I want to keep us, uh, yes. I want to keep you on task here yep, as, we, as, we go, as we go through the design. But we do need to make note of uh, John okay. Cranz's ex excellent idea to have a launch party in Tobruk. Uh, we may need to... Uh, okay. We may need to double check on the uh, security aspects of that, but I guess we could always try. I guess be able to get a visa to Libya. So, um, <laughs> um, just one quick thing here. I've got you yep. can see on the map here is a kind of a blue, gray, white dotted lines. Uh, there are uh, these are air sector boundaries, and the original game did not address air units in the least, not even abstract air points. Well, I'm going to flip mm. back over to the area to the. Uh, Air, um, to the counter sheets real quick. Perfect. I have a complete order battle of all of the air units available for both sides here. And, uh, um, and, and the reason why I wanted to include air is not because I like airplanes, although I do, but it was during this campaign that both sides started to really develop the quality of air to ground cooperation and, and liaisons and forward air controllers and embedded um, um, embedded radio nets and things like that so to allow for basically on call air support. And so I built that, I built an air system, um, the advanced games air system for for being able to use all these air units in here and um, and, and actually call in bombing strikes. Um, and different have different air missions and what have you. There's a little whole, whole thing going on with that. Um, but uh, the uh, air sectors, I'm going to flip over here real quick to my other resources. Yeah, please do. So here's, here, here is a, an air display. I'll, I'll just bring it up on the, on the, I'm still sharing, right? You can see my screen. Yeah, you're good. You're good, man. But let's, let's uh, make sure you just you know, double click that and uh, then let's zoom in on that boy. Okay. 
Uh, John has a question for you. Do the there allies do, do the allies have a chance to win, uh, Chris? Oh, absolutely. There you absolutely. go, John. Absolutely. I have a very sorry. Uh, my no, you're 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 good. You're good. This is I working. think I I opened up. Uh, yes, the historical victory conditions. Well, the the Port of Tobruk was everybody's goal. So right. if you've got to work, you win the game. However, you could lose the battle by losing too much of your army as well. Or if you are the allies, you could, if you keep Tobruk, you win. But if you lose Tobruk but manage to get your army off the map, then Rommel's going to have to mess with that army somewhere further to the east. So um, if, you, if the allies get enough of their forces off the map, but still lose to Brook, they could gain uh, some form of a victory. Likewise, if uh, Rommel takes to Brook but loses all of his armor uh, and, and, and most of his forces taking it, uh, he's not going to be able to follow on with an additional, uh, keep the campaign going. So the victory conditions are very simple. Keep to Brook and keep your army intact. you got to do both. So um, the allies could lose to Brook but not lose the game by smashing the Africa core in the, in the process. Gotcha. Gotcha. And just a real quick uh, comment for everybody. Hey guys, uh, I, I'm having a few little Wi-Fi issues here. We have three little networks on my house and my, my Wi-Fi seems to be skipping from one to the other. So if you're losing connection or, or hearing choppy sound, it's probably my fault. So my apologies. So John, uh, why don't you share share a little bit about, oh, sorry, John, uh, Chris, why don't you share a little bit about the air war? And then I want to ask you about the rules. I'd like to talk about the rules next. Sure. All right, so the um, the advanced air game is the full Monty here. Right? It's just it's got all those air units in there, multiple different types of of uh, missions that the aircraft can be sent on. That's represented by the boxes on these uh, on these displays, which are hidden from the other player. So you've got a, 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 bit, a quite a bit of fog of war. But you can see here the the image the background image of this air display is the actual game map so this is tied to the different parts of the game map where these uh, where these missions go now this is the axis air display so the um, the axis uh, bases you know back off into uh, into uh, that part of Libya but uh, just off map here uh, you can you can base guys out here at Barça and Labrac and Martuba and over uh, in Heraklion, and you can fly them with, with sufficient range to the map or to other parts of the display. So the Allies have their display too, and they've got the Gambut and Sidi Barani, Matru and Fuka airboxes. That's where their bases are. And this is an opportunity to get places for the Germans to bomb the bases at, in Gambut. So you can, you can do some offensive counter air. You can. Uh, uh, have fighter sweeps to, you know, try to clean the skies of the enemy fighters, so you can go in and do your combat support missions with your Stukas or or right. uh, the Hura bombers or whatever uh, uh, weapon you're able to to bring to bear here. So this is. Uh, I'm just going to zoom back out so you can see the whole thing. So this yeah. is from the Allied player who's got a similar copy uh, available to them. And you're this. You're actually putting your air units on this display. Gotcha. Uh, I have a I have a question about this. Uh, how how is it possible? And does it impact the game or gameplay? Uh, is it possible for the Germans to uh, uh, deprecate the supply capacity of the Tobruk port? That that was a pretty significant effort uh, from an air war perspective. Did that happen, or does that happen in this game? Is that a an issue or part of it? I, I really suppressed any kind of supply considerations down to the there were there weren't any problems with supplies other than other than Rommel when he made his wide right hook, um, he 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 really did not give himself enough of a leash, so his trucks couldn't get up there bring enough petrol to his vehicles quickly enough. So um, and that's where the cauldron battle uh, came about. I'm going to 
think I might mute you here real quick. Someone's going to ring my doorbell. No, nope. oh, that's okay. okay. <laughs> you, you know what? <laughs> you know what would be cool? Why, why don't you pop the uh, pop the map back up, and then do me a favor and turn your if if you're able to inside the Streamyard app, just turn your camera off, and I, I'll and we'll just let's put the zoom in on the map just a, a little bit more, and then let's leave that up so folks can see it, and let's us let's us keep chatting so that we can. Um, I have to turn off my camera here. Uh, so if you go, well, if you go to, if you go down the bottom, it says start cam, stop cam in, in the app. And then I just let's go back. Yeah, let's go back to sharing the screen and just share your, uh, I'm just trying to improve the bandwidth for everybody so they can, they can, yeah. Yeah, you're, no, I'm breaking up and you're breaking up. No one wants to look at me anyway. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's all about the game, right? All right so, all right, so the map, uh, it's two map sheets. Um, the printed on one side is the terrain key. Uh, also printed on the other side is the turn record chart, so it's easy to have. And there's also up in the upper uh, corner, northeast mm -hmm. corner, uh, weather. So we got airplanes, we got weather. The weather was a major consideration uh, during this mm -hmm. time here in the North Africa. Uh, sandstorms blew up constantly, and they're... If those show up in your game, your aircraft are going to be pretty much grounded and ground operations are going to slow down to a crawl because they did. It even affected the uh, the electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic frequency uh, spectrum and made radio communications more difficult by having a lot more static in the air. So command ranges are reduced in, 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 in a snowstorm, uh, sandstorms too. So um, those are a very real possibility here. Looking back over here, uh, so we've got uh, I've got an, an allied air display. I've got an Axis air display. There's a screen here that's going to come in the game. A little bit of uh, arts and crafts required to get it ready. Uh, a couple of cuts and some folds, and it's that's the stand-up display here. Um, but also, I did at, at John's request include uh, some more simplified air rules so that you could. Um, you're not going to be able to play this uh, full air game really well solitaire. You're going to lose a lot of that shell game component. Sure, uh, sure. To do it solitaire. But I did, and I wanted to create something that would allow folks to have some, um, still have the air, uh, results of air uh, missions affect the ground uh, game. So I put some basic air table, it's a basics or solitaire air rules together that just gives you a you know, an odd shift based upon uh, some die rolls and uh, what have you. So you could, you you can completely set aside all of the air counters, the air right. is the screen, and, and just focus on the ground game and having a very simplified air system for you. Now that's fine. Gotcha. That, that's, 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 and I, I, I think that's smart, right? That Because a, a lot of folks want to get into the game and play it, and they just want to, they, they appreciate the air war, but they don't want to grind through whether it's, you know, it, it, extra five five pages or ten pages plus the doubling of gameplay time if it, if right. it's that much or whatever it may be. If and particularly solo, you're going to lose the uh, the effect. The effect. So, question for you: mm -hmm. When you're writing the rules, and and particularly given that you you are uh, you know uh, for everybody who's been joining in the last 20, 30 minutes, full of full of to Brook is a it, it's not a. a, a a reprint or a uh, a, a, a re a, sorry it's not a reprint of the fall of the brook from 1975 Frank Chadwick's game it's more of a reimagining I would call it so we're using the name of the game and we're taking the the base concepts and a lot of the mechanics from the original design and when, then we're we're lifting it up and uh, enhancing it and polishing it and and making it obviously look like this fantastic right uh, but what I'm curious about given the sparse nature of Chadwick's rule writing and his crisp, you know, generally speaking, crisp, crystal clear, crisp writing. How, how do you go about writing your rules and how do you go about uh, representing them? Is it case-based? Do you use a sort of paragraph style? Uh, is it painful for you? Do you get your mum to help you with grammar? What happens? Um. I find it difficult to play a game 
with uh, our current sensibilities of how rules should be um, should be organized and and uh, cover the with 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 specifically um, the clarity required to be able to read the rules and not have to interpret anything. Um, the original rules could not have met that criteria. They could not stand up, um, even though they worked fine for 1975 and I knew what, what they meant. It might be different if I was playing somebody else. Somebody else might get a different interpretation over the same passage in the rules because it wasn't, um, it wasn't written in a, in a more legally uh, definite structure, if that makes sense. So very, very natural conversational flow to them. A lot of things were assumed, hey, you know what I mean. Just move according to normal movement rules that you guys already know. You know, <laughs> that sort of thinking through it. So it was all, everybody, you know, still small club mentality. Everybody's, a, you know, member of the club, even if you, you know, back in the 70s, it's, that's how it was. It wasn't, it wasn't there for, you know, international consumption or anything like that, or non-native uh, English speakers had to figure it out, or someone who didn't understand what these war games were, you were expected to be a war gamer, and here are the rules. Figure right. any, any part you can't figure out, just sort it out, and if you can't sort it out, roll a die, you know, that sort of thing. That, that's how they were written, and, and yeah. I, I had to... I had to change that. The paragraph style is 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 interesting for recreational reading, but for um, technical writing, it's not going to work. It's also uh, um, we're so accustomed to. I'm so accustomed. I'm I'm not speaking for everybody, but I think the prevailing wisdom is is I need a rules reference out there to be able to have a conversation with somebody else about this game. So. Um, and that's, you know, going back to that international um, yes. appeal, the, the ability to be able to reference something um, from the same context is important. So the rules needed a, a, a major rewrite. Well, the scale of the game, um, the scale of the game didn't change, the scale of the map changed. So I had to take some other considerations into account. I completely replaced the combat system, added a, a formerly non-existent air system that meets in with that, um, yep. and, 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 and just basically revised some of the other systems that were there. But at the core... And it's D10, and it's, is it, is it D10, and it's D10, so I'm sorry for interrupting, Chris. It's D10 based versus 2D6, right? That's true. I changed that, too. Yep. Carry on. Yeah, so um, where there were D6 tables or 2D6 tables for the combat, I made everything a straight percentage and uh, used the D10. That's just my preference. I nice. like the D10, but it makes it, it's more comfort more comforting for me. So <laughs> taking a look here, so here's here's some of the player aid card. It's very simple, straightforward. There's the train effects chart. There's a command and control table that gives you the number of activations that you're allowed to to do when you pull a chip of, say, the Italian division, you roll the D10 to see how much, uh, how many actions you can take with that unit. There's um, artillery range, uh, so mm -hmm. uh, the further you fire, the less effective you are. So anything over half range is half value. That was a legacy of the original game. Stacking density. This is something I added here. The more strength points you toss into a hex, the more likely artillery and bombs will find something to hit. So there's odd sh there, there's column shifts on the bombardment activities if you've got a lot of factors in there, a lot of uh, uh, stacking points, not, not strength points, but stacking points. Um, the original game had minefields attack you when you were trying to cross them, um, either to conduct an attack or conduct a retreat or just not gingerly tiptoe across them. If you wanted to really just keep moving, you had you got an attack because you were coming through rather clumsily, and you could actually get some disruptions or or lose some tanks on the way in. One thing that was new was this morale checks table because there was no morale <clears throat> indicated in the original game, and I that's that's a feature of the combat system that I, I it added. Now on the other side of the player aid card, this is all the combat table. Now. 
Um, can you uh, can you zoom in on that one, Chris? Let's open that up fully and have a look, just so folks can see. Because otherwise, it's a little uh, and I, I, we probably don't want to sort of grind on it. But let's just have a, a talk yeah. about it because there's I see three different um, at least three different uh, modes or two different modes of no three different modes of combat here. So um, hopefully you can see it well enough here. But the, yep. um, uh, before I jump into this, I'm going to say this is this is an idea that I lifted from another game, another designer. Okay. Uh, I who was that? Uh, Herman Lopeman, who did ah. the, the, the Civil War blind sword system. Uses Fantastic. A, I love that. I, I, the reason I love it, it, it integrates morale and hardware very well into a single uh, combat system. Uh, all I needed to do would be to add in the training aspect, which I can easily do with odd shifts and what have you. So mm -hmm. that is, this is an adaptation of that basic system, which is going to give you a wide variety of results. And it's going to have combat affecting both sides. So because of this system, both sides do take a shot, if you will. So both, both sides have a, uh, they're making their own role on a combat table every time there's a combat. So if I'm attacking you at three to one, you might be returning fire to me at one to two, gotcha. or one to three. If I'm attacking you at one to one, maybe we're both attacking each other at one to one and we're each rolling our own separate results. So there is, uh, there, you mentioned before, I've got, I've, got, um, I've got columns to roll for different uh, air bombardment values. I've got um, mm -hmm. a column to find there on the artillery how many bombardment factors am I putting on this artillery attack? And also for um, anti-tank fires is actually four four different combat systems all rolled into one because anti-tank fire has an uh, is a separate subphase of combat that occurs before uh, regular combat. So you've got uh, close yeah, combat. That's interesting. <clears throat> Let me flip over to the the back to the units real quick. So, yeah, because that's similar, similar in concept to uh, Jaws of Victory did something similar like that, where where they took uh, there was an AT phase, uh, an armored combat phase, an anti tank uh, combat mm -hmm. phase in the uh, Jaws of Victory game system as well. So that's pretty cool. Carry on. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, th this was legacy of of the original game that there would gotcha. be an anti tank fire area, and I wanted to retain that. I even want to emphasize it because some of these units have, were very very uh, very good at um, anti-tank combat. Um, some of the units didn't have a lot of anti-tank capability. But here's mm -hmm. back to the Italians looking at, here's the Italian tanks. Um, you'll notice in the center of the tank units, there's a, a red tube off by itself. That's the defense factor of all the units, whether it's either going to be black or it's going to be red. If it's black, it's soft target. If it's red, it's hard target. Every unit also has a hard attack slash soft attack strength. So this, this Italian tank shoots at other tanks with a value of two. It shoots at infantry, anything with a black defense strength at, with a two, and, it's, and, it, and it, it's, it's shot at with a two defense strength. So um, something that has uh, a lot of anti-tank capability. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some of those lovely... Here's an Italian battery of um, 88s that they got off the Germans up mm. here. Um, mm -hmm. It was actually uh, more Italian 88s in the desert at this point than German 88s. Um, and th they were all given to the Italians. They're very early models of them, but they were here, have a few dozen 88s for this. But so here, this 88 shoots with a value of six. Well, that means it can get a three to one on one of these tanks. But you can decide if there's a stack of, say, six of these guys, six of these Italians. Let's, let's just say we've got, uh, um, the, I know 88s aren't going to shoot at their countrymen, but just for the sake sure, of sure. Keep, keep this screen up here. Uh, if I had three of these Italian tanks in there and I was opposed by one of those units like that 88 that had an attack strength of six, I could, if I'm shooting that, at six, I could choose to fire at one, two, or all three of those tanks with the single die roll. It's up to me what I shoot at in that hex. So even going back to this combat table, 
I don't have to shoot at everybody, but that just means I'm not going to have any effect on the guys that I don't shoot at. So I, right. can, I can single out some of the units in there. There are some restrictions in that. You can't shoot at my artillery if I've got non-artillery screening them, for example. Um, you know, if I've got an infantry and artillery, you're not going to get at my, my cannons unless you're also attacking my infantry. So, um, so that's how that all works. But you, Very you, cool. basically, you, you, you take the anti-tank fire, you roll on the table. Did I get a, an L, an M, or an H result based upon the, the lead unit's morale? And then you go look at, well, um, fire combat resolution. This is my anti-tank fire. Uh, if I get a heavy result in there, I'm going to be disrupting some of them. I'm going to be knocking some of them out. But there's not a lot of kills, except right. when, except when you shoot more than they can absorb. Then you're going to be right. Killed. Well, and that's that's actually pretty accurate. From what the the historical stuff that I've read and, and sort of first person accounts that I've read, uh, there's a great book called The Beginning of the End of the Beginning or the Beginning of the Beginning of the End, I think it was, and uh, it, it went through some first person accounts of uh, Royal Horse Artillery units sort of being pushed up into the fight. They're supposed to be supporting a, a tank battle or a uh, uh, you know an, an infantry advance or something like that, and uh, they, they're they firing at the Germans, but they're not necessarily having a whole lot of effect, but they're disrupting the impact of their counterfire enough to to give the, the, the British troops uh, a chance to sort of close with the enemy if you want to, if I want to use that sort of that sort of terminology. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And that's interesting if that, that kind of play, if that actually allows this sort of, that sort of historical effect to play out, that'd be pretty cool. There's a lot of, you're not going to be, um, now within a combat, at this scale, a couple of tanks here and there and every encounter are going to be destroyed or damaged or something. Yep, yep. Uh, some of this, some of that's happening below the scale of the units, however. Sure. Uh, and, and it's reflected by the inability of that company to be effective in combat. It's disrupted. It's flipped over. It has half value. Well, if if I do enough of that, I'm either going to disrupt the entire force or maybe even go beyond that. And two disruptions is equal to a kill. If I have to disrupt someone who's already disrupted, they're dead. Okay, now they're the counter's eliminated. They right. go to the map, or if there's tanks, they go into the whole the whole right. tank replacement bit. And that's something else that I kept from the original game, as uh, which was just yeah, yeah, good, good. Right, because tank recovery was a big deal uh, for for the Germans in particular. Yeah, so um, interesting. Um, so, so tell me about from from a rule. So, rules writing perspective, we talked a little bit about your style and the the, the case referencing and, and things like that uh, versus paragraph re referencing, which is really a whole topic we could talk about uh, as a group of war gamers about our rules preferences and the things that we like and don't like. And maybe you could pop that map back up. That'd be great. Uh, but uh, if we, um, you, we could talk about that ad nauseum, right? The, uh, the, the things that we like and don't like about rules. What about indexing and examples of play and things like that? Because this feels like people are going to get this game and they're going to go, okay, I got this game. Now what the hell do I do, right? Because it because you've got some unique, not only some unique concepts, but you also have uh, what I would call fresh and innovative as well uh, here. So how how are folks going to engage and, and just like tactilely engage with the game so they can learn it? All right, um, that's kind I, of a, that's kind of a hard question. Uh, my apologies for it, but there no, it is. That's a good that's a good point. Um, I approach it, and, and I, I put up the, my draft, my pre-layout mm -hmm. rules. Okay, so bear with me. This is very kludgy. This is just my my limited capabilities of, of, of layout here. But uh, just so you can see what sort of information and how the information is organized, there are, are you know, so I use color. I use different fonts. I use a text. Mm -hmm. I use uh, headings to find make it easier to find. Uh, I need to find 3.0 sequence of play fast. Okay, here it is, nice and bold. We're going to see that in the rules. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, let me see if I can. Find, here's some examples. I, and I'm trying to decide 
do I want to have the entire example show in, a, in an alternate color? I don't want to get crazy with colors, but right. let me give an example here. And I've got a couple of those. They're all in italics throughout. Now, I have seen some other rules, and I really like the style uh, that uh, has like all of these examples or sidebar notes actually over in the sidebar. So you've got mm -hmm. like two thirds column going down the page, and then on one side, you just have a spot for examples and, and oh, by the way, um, uh, Hell's Highway and old Vic Victory Games was very good at doing that. Uh, they had some innovative rules layout techniques. I'm not, I don't think we're going to go there with this one, but we're going to have it copiously illustrated. Um, there are going to be a lot more illustrations than what you see here, but here shows an example of, you know, how, how to, how to, how to stack, you know, um, this is what represents an overstack tax. You can, actually, <laughs> you can actually, and, and what impact that has. I could put the entire, literally the entire Africa core could have fit in one hex. You could line up track to track, hub to hub, shoulder to shoulder, they would fit in there. And you drop a few bombs in there and they're going to get wasted. But you could have fit them in the space of the hex. So you can overstack. You can put more stuff in there than we'll than would normally fit for operations, but the, their operations are going to be curtailed a little bit. Um, so there are just some examples of that. These are going to get nice and dressed up because these are just my crude examples for tables and what have you. But um, the game is organized. I'm sorry. Um, uh, there we go. The game is organized around not necessarily following the sequence of play, although I do like that technique. And I followed it for Bar Lev. What it meant, though, is that you had to read into Rule Section 17 before you figure out how to move. It was that far deep into the sequence of play it was the movement phase. So that was a barrier to easy learning. It was great for reference. This one is more geared towards easy learning. So I'm going to talk about. So let's get some general game concepts. Okay, one of the first things we deal in a turn deal with in a turn is getting some reinforcements replacements. Let's talk about that. We need to uh, we need to talk about, you know, some of the basic aspects of um, air planning. We still get, you know, into in the uh, um, rule section 10 before we talk about movement, just because there's so much happening. It This is remember, this game does not have a movement phase come first. It has operation. Movement, yes. combat, artillery, yes. air, everything all happening at once. It's it's whatever you make up your own turn. And that's going to frankly, that's going to throw some people because they're not going to be told exactly how to come up with how, how to use these pieces. You're going to have to learn about the armies. Right. So, 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 so that's that's really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting, Chris, because that, and I'm not saying this is like BCS at all, because <laughs> it's not. But one of the things that is a challenge with BCS, the Battalion Combat System or series, whatever it's called, from MMP, is that you know you've got all these great capabilities, but you've got to work out the right sequence of using them and and the, and the right timing and which which goes with what right does does chocolate go with vanilla or is strawberry better with chocolate and you've got to work out how to deploy the tanks and the 88s and the infantry and breach the minefield or the fortification or whatever it is you're doing apply the air do the recon and that that's to me that's kind of cool now you're now you're a tactician right yeah that was the whole point of this game Perfect. Really. the Love whole point of this game was to uh it, it like i said earlier you peel back the layers of the onion instead of having uh, i could uh, and i've actually made a gazala game where i've got a unit the whole the whole doggone brigades there and it's got a factor of six you know all of that is just <laughs> down into uh a, a very simplistic combat model well this one tries to get into it a little bit more uh, a little bit more design for cause than the design for right. that, right. that interesting that's that's that was intentional without being i did but i didn't want to make it uh difficult i wanted to make it realistic 
the difficulty right. comes not in learning the rules, but in learning the pieces, learning yes. the capabilities of the different component. You need to learn right. when to call in an airstrike, when to call in an artillery bombardment, right. because there was no prescription that said, okay, guys, it's 715, time to shoot artillery. Everybody shoots at once now. It doesn't work that way. That's yeah, nice. so, so, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I think, you know, I think from that perspective, 2020, 2021 called and said, hey, 1975, let's just, let's stop with the, I, I'm playing a little simple little game right now that is just so rote <laughs> that I'm kind of like, okay, I, I'm going to get four more turns of this thing done and I'm, then I'm going to write it up and I, I, it's cute, but it's, completely divorced, divorced from anything to do with war game or, or what happened in that particular theater. So it's a challenge, right? If it's not done right. It's game versus simulation. Yeah. And I, and I think there's a nice balance there, right? And in fact, I'm going to put my camera back on. Let's brave the camera. I'm going to put my camera back on, going to share so we can chat about this a little bit. Um, I moved again, guys, because uh, it got hot outside. I was yeah. starting, to, starting to sweat. Uh, but I, I think I, I think there's a there's a nice balance between game and simulation, where you feel like you're playing as the general or as the the commander on in the field at the at the appropriate scale. Oh, at, at, well, by the way, it looks like you've got some nice indexing and stuff there too. So, 24 pages of rules. That's pretty impressive, Chris. Um, but but you, you you're capturing a lot with a little here, and and that's that's oh, there's a lot to be said for that. Let me uh, put you back up on full screen. Sorry, what do you got there? Appendix of play, extent, expanded sequence of play. This talk talk about a, that for a sec. Yeah, th this. Yeah, let me uh, zoom in so we can see a little bit more. So um, one of the other things that I did was um, I, I I split the. I split the map scale in half. I also split the time scale in half. Um, the movement, the movement allowances were too small for that old map, and the range allowances were too big for that. Right. So when I when I changed the game scale, the 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 map scale, I realized that I'm also going to need to either make the unit. If I was going to try to do a 24-hour turn like the game was designed for, I'm going to have to make these guys move so far as as to be ridiculous. There's there's no opportunity to to right. um, for thrust and counter thrust. So I need to keep the movement allowances small. The only way to do smaller, at least, the only way to do that was to split it up into um, different phases. So I have yep. you know, So it's an impulsive system. So yep, don't yep. you do the you do the early morning things. We, then we do the AM phases and then the PM phases, and we wrap up with dusk. Gotcha. So on, on a particular we, turn, just walk through this real quick. You do the weather, yep. so the weather can be different on the morning as for the afternoon. Very common at this time of the year in Libya. Uh, then we do air planning phase, uh, provided we don't have a fencing, a, a, a sandstorm. So simultaneous air planning, or if we're using the, the solitaire basic air rules, just forget it. Skip the air planning phase because it's all going to be done during operations. But then you pull an activation marker representing one of the brigades or uh, divisions that's in play. Pull it from the cup. You roll. We look at that um, command and control table. And I think I closed it. No, never mind. Um, you roll the command and control table. There it is. Yep. And, and uh, determine the number of activation points you get for that formation. And that's the number of stacks, basically, you can move. Um, without getting into the details, you can also move units of other formations that are cross-attached to you, like, say, down from corps or army, or even create a comp group of you know, okay, I'm going to take some units of 90th Light Division and 5th, 15th Panzer, and uh, I'll even pull in some Italian motorized infantry here because that's what I've got available. I need to get it, these guys into contact. So I'm going to spend my activation points on this ad hoc grouping of guys. So long as right. some of them, you know, it, the, as long as you're activating some guys from that formation, you're, you're right. It's it's kind of it's kind of a it's kind of a building an ad hoc comp group. 
That's basically what you're doing there, really. We're using your AP AP allocation to who can I pull together to let's go hit this point in the line and break through and see what we can see what happens. Right. So you're not really even though I pulled the chip for 15th Panzer, I could move out units of other mm -hmm. weapons mm -hmm. that haven't already activated for that turn. You know, once you can't, I, I can't keep moving the same piece over and over and over and over again. Um, you know, I'm, I'm allowed to move it once. I'm allowed to have combat with it once. Uh, in, in a gotcha. you know, once gotcha. in the morning, once in the afternoon. So uh, what what I did here, then you can choose to do an artillery impulse, or I can choose to do an air impulse, or I can choose to do a movement impulse, or I can choose to do a combat impulse. And the choice can be repeated. So I could do a combat impulse with two units. Say, so, dog done, I didn't get the result I wanted. Maybe I'll do another combat impulse with some other units. Maybe I should do some artillery in their first assault. Mm. I'm going to do an artillery impulse, and I'm come back and do a combat impulse. I'm going to do a movement impulse to do, move some more guys up there and deliver the, the death blow to them, and then hit them with air. And then I'm going to do another combat impulse. So it's this back and forth, boom, boom, boom. It's a boxing match, a jousting match, whatever. Uh, devising the perfect, if you will, the appropriate operations phase. It's going to be up to the players. And like I said, the, the, everybody who's used to being told, now it's time to move all of your guys in the right. movement phase. All movement right. must be completed before anything else. Not so. But the way we track all of, of course, we have to we have to mark the units that have been moved. So I've got some markers in the in the game for movement complete or combat complete or gotcha. I fired these guys for bombardment. I can't move them or things like that. So there, there, there's a, a bit of a marker overhead on the units because of the have to, having to flag the various statuses. So that's what the cleanup phase is. Let's get all those right. operations, complete markers off the map. Right, but you've got a dynamic, you've got a dynamic operations phase, so that's kind of to be expected. So I can see how that would uh, would would make sense for you to be able to keep track of, if those things with the markers so that's a price you pay otherwise you sit there and go now did i move that guy or didn't i and then people complain yeah. and you've got to publish some you know a counter shoot for everybody so the original game did not have markers <laughs> the original game said right you had to remember work it, it already fought. work it out you you're, you're a war gamer <laughs> you're a war gamer work it out right <laughs> you'll, you'll know how to do this you'll probably have some mechanism already that's <laughs> but that's it okay so uh wh where do we clock so I'm, i now see a page number 36 so where do we clock in at uh total uh rules page count for uh, our for roughly at this draft stage well this is going to be a, a separate player eight card instead of uh just okay. back of the book probably okay. two of them um I did, uh, this is a detailed appendix with, with sample counters for all the markers and everything in the game. That's going to nice. be in the rules. Um, all a discussion of formations and things like that. All of this is going to be an appendix. Mm -hmm. uh, a, lot of, a lot of information that normally gets in the way of your, of your yep. learning, the, the learning flow. So things that would be in that sidebar, for example, are, are in the back. They're in the appendix. Detailed component. And again, this is all this is all pre-production quality artwork. This is all the stuff I did for sure, this playbook. Sure, sure. that. So, so none of this is actually final. Ken, Ken at Compass is going to do a great job of the layout. He just been, does fantastic work. Um, yeah, I'm really I'm really impressed with their rule their rule book development uh, of late. It's been great. But getting back. So you're right. The link here. How many this, pages? This axis setup. Well, actually, this is going to be a separate card as well. So that comes out of the book, and I actually, I, you know, wish. So I, we're probably talking under. We're under forty pages would be the net here, right? Probably, and 30, probably more, probably more like thirty, thirty-two, or twenty, twenty-five. Oh, I like that. Okay, setup zones. Thirty-two, I think, is where we're planning. But if we yeah. need. 
if we want to have some more detailed examples of play, that might go up to 36. Just keeping in mind, it's going to be some factor of four pages. Yep. That's just so the Allied setup was in the book. It's now a separate uh, cardstock piece. This is the Allied setup, and it's color coded back to the found uh, the f uh, formation colors that are printed on the counters. Right. Nice. Let me uh, let me get to. Uh, now I've got two choices for the axis. This is um, the historical start point where they, Rommel's already done his hook. Uh, this is dawn on the 27th of May, and they're already on the flank of the Allied Army. But you can also start it that night before and actually play out. Where does the Africa Corps go? Where does the Italian 20th Corps go? They were initially sent around the, the southern end, uh, one, one division taking a wrong right, a wrong left turn and get the, got itself lost. Or maybe I want to change the plan and maybe I want to barrel straight down this road and bash through mm -hmm. straight to Tobruk instead of trying to go around. Because the end run, well, um, one of the things that you may not you may notice is there's no roads going into the middle of the desert except yeah. British cross country and trucks don't work well so the supply line for the in the round is very short past the beer hakim i mean that, that they can't get much further than this and stay in supply they need this track running right down the middle or something a little bit better inland even they need to have a major supply line to be able to extend the distance from off map to Tobruk, this isn't the way to do that. So that's why they had to come back around here and have the cauldron battle so they could open up that supply line. Yeah, well, yeah, you interesting. Could, you could choose to start the game off just bashing through there to start. <laughs> you know you're going to have to end up coming here anyway. This gives the Germans, the Axis player, some flexibility. I'm saying yeah, this is where Rommel's plan took him. Where yep. is Kev's plan going to take him? Yeah, probably right up the guts. But um, and, and and so from the uh, from from the Allied standpoint, or, uh, in terms of their strategy and how they approach the the battle, what what are, do they have a significant number of choices, or are they sitting there and taking a beating, uh, counter but obviously not doing much by counterattack. I imagine. Well, there is a, there is, um, unfortunately, there is a surprise element to this, which is uh, unusual. I mean, a surprise rule element to the game, meaning that the Brits have some limited, the Germans get the first few activations is how I've done that. The, the Axis side gets the first full, like the first five activations. So they can get things done before the ally, uh, before the British can really react on them. And that was just to reflect not knowledge of what the enemy was doing, but um, uncertain. They were still believing the attack was going to come straight through the South Africans on the coast. They were thinking, well, it's just some recon elements, I'm sure. Right. Because right. <laughs> in their right mind is going to send significant forces out into the middle of that nasty terrain. Who but Rommel? Yeah. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating yeah. campaign overall, isn't it? It is. It is. So there is that that lack of belief at the higher levels that Rommel would do anything other than what the British expected uh, him to do, and which is not what he ended up doing. But the, that that mindset um, plagued the British uh, higher uh, command echelons for quite some time. Well, until the time uh, Montgomery took over, I'm not a big fan of Monty's, but uh, I think he did right was was stop thinking like the enemy was going to do what you wanted him to do. And, sorry, and well, the, he's capable of doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Capability assessment. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Well, well, so uh, if there now we've we've kind of I, I usually try and keep these things pretty tight at an hour, and we've enjoyed an hour and a half. 
Uh, and I'm just oh, looking okay. through my, uh, and you're doing great. I'm, I'm looking at my little list of comments here that I wanted to make sure I covered off on. And I think I got most of them down. The, <clears throat> so were there, is there anything that you think you might want to share with your, with any potential viewers or potential folks who are going to pre-order that they might care to, uh, that you might care to share before we do a, a wrap up? Um, this is not a small footprint game. This is not something that uh, you can play in a two hour in an evening. This is a um, there. There are short, simplistic, fun games on this battle. There are long, involved, fun games on this battle. And this is one of the latter. Um, it, it's more advanced in terms of what it's trying to do and how it's trying to get there. Not so much, it's not a, a rules concept heavy. I mean, it's not a, a complex system. Once you do a few of these combats, um, it's it's just boom, boom, boom. Both sides are rolling. Yep, yep, yep. Bang, 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 bang. There's three rolls each side. You're done with the combat. It becomes second nature, very easy to, to execute. And... The, the difficulty then becomes how to integrate all of those rules in the pieces I give you to into right. a winning plan. And that hopefully will come out of repeated play. Right. I, I hope yeah, you yeah. play this game often enough to get good at it, good enough at it to figure out how to really play. It. Right. So, so that's an interesting question that perhaps we, we should maybe, um, touch on for a second so uh i've played simple games and complex games and medium level complexity games rules consumption is one thing uh, proficiency in the system is another how uh what do you think this you, you've kind of led the witness here a little bit saying that the game is probably more for the the longer game playing um more of a grog grognard style game player obviously not this is not an introductory game we we got that right we, but where where do you see it fits in terms of the, the scale of complexity number one and number two uh, when you say uh I'm repeated, re repeated repeated plays how many plays do you think you need to get in to kind of get comfortable with the system and the game and the tactics to play effectively both sides. I was trying to remember what we rated this at with the solitaire uh, suitability and complexity. I think it's on the web page. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, you know, but I was just curious from your opinion versus, you know, ratings or ratings, right? A seven, right, a seven right. to me, a seven to me is a four to somebody else, right? I, I'm slow, yeah. so <laughs> right, so so yeah. everything everything's hard for me. But uh, uh, and, and I'm going to preface that by. Shortly after playing uh, this game in, in junior high school, or maybe even before that, I was also playing Third Reich. So, uh, and, and my first actual games were Anzio and Jutland, Avalon Hill games, not listed as the, you know, entry level games. So I, my earliest experiences were with games that were complicated. I just didn't know at the gotcha. time yep. they were at the higher end of the complexity scale. Right. So that was my only experience. They were fun. I really enjoyed it. So my background is I don't mind the chewy. Sure. Uh, with that caveat on mind, this is this is a um, this is a medium body game. It's not uh, okay. it's one of those connoisseur, if, if you will, you know very dry astringent red wines that you appreciate more than right. actually enjoy. Right. I'm hoping not. I'm hoping that uh, the people, this is the sort of game that people who like this sort of game will enjoy. Uh, and it's probably not going to be, I, I'm shooting myself in the foot. I'm a designer. I'm getting paid for this, but I'm honest. Yeah. It, oh, it, look, the last thing you want to do, the last thing you want to do. Right? Like small footprint games that you can move half a dozen counters on, you can be done with it. You're not going to, um, your money's not going to be well spent here because this is a game that needs to be spread out. The Vassal module 
will get you spread out as well. Right. Um, right. Playing this, interacting with somebody else is the ideal experience of it. So you can get that fog of war, the aircraft. Okay, I'm going to call in that airstrike now uh, and smash this hex, disrupt everybody, cutting everybody's defense value in half before I come in there and with my big punch armor. But all of a sudden, oh no, that air that airstrike didn't work and I don't have any more bombers. What do I do now? My artillery's out of range or it's already moved and limbered up still. Do I do, do I delay the attack and let them get away or just try right. to get away? Right. Well, so so I think there's a, uh, so a couple of things. Um, I appreciate your frankness in, in regards to where you feel the game sits. And I, I think there's a over-reliance evolving in the hobby overall with, well, where's my solitaire system? Where's my hand holding? I need 15 videos to train me. And can I have a you know 15 turn uh, sequence of, uh, not sequence of play, uh, example of the gameplay. Like it, it, you know, if you want to play a, a complicated, slightly different game with different mechanics, you're going to need to pick the freaking rule book up and read the rules and work it out. And it may mean you need to try it multiple times. Now, that said, I am the first person to hold the designer and the company accountable for get your artwork right, get the get the index right, get the charts right, make the rules consistent and clear and concise, and all that. All that uh, you know should be. We've been doing this for a long time now, right? We we should get that right, right? Uh, as far as that's concerned, but it's still incumbent upon me as the game player just to get up off my backside and learn the game, right? So. So I'm very curious. I, I, the reason why I wanted to interview you because I was on the fence about whether I wanted to, you know, put that slap the eighty bucks down to go try it because there's a thousand games out there, right? And I love the desert uh, conflict. I've put all my a lot of money into BCS and I've enjoyed that system, but I still don't get it. <laughs> I play it really badly. Uh, I love DAC two. I play uh, the Cauldron and G Gazala from Re Revolution Games. You name it, right? Just Tons of games, but anytime someone comes along that that's doing something, I think you're doing something from what I've heard anyway, innovative and interesting and accessible with a bit of work, right? Taking stealing stuff from other players is not necessarily innovation. Well, well, oh, well, well, is, well is, okay, right, all right. So you're a, you're a common thief. I have a claim. <laughs> I have no thinking here. I'm, I'm, Chris Fawcett, the common thief of game game mechanics, has put together this thing that's kind of a kludge of a bunch of other shit. I mean, that doesn't really sound as appealing, does it? So, so, but I think you're using Lutman's using Lutman's system, genius, building on Frank Chadwick's original design. Yeah, really can't go wrong because he's an amazing designer. So I think that that's a type of innovation, right? It's it, it, it's you're seeing things that work. And then you've applied them and work. Anyway, is this going to work here? You've tested it. It does. That's good stuff. So I, I think that's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll claim the I'll claim the phrase. I'll claim the innovation uh, moniker here. And the reason for that is um, a long time ago, I, I sat in on a continuous quality improvement seminar, and they were talking about the differences between innovation and and revolution or evolution. Right. Right. And, uh, yeah, and they were. It was on a kind of a, 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 a an amorphous line across a graph that constantly shifting, and the edge between what we know and what we don't know yet is what was being measured on this graph. And things that were way out, outliers, just jumping forward into the unknown, and and having a little blob on this chart were the revolutionary ideas. And the inverse of that was the gaps left behind was as events or as ideas kind of moved past, there was an opportunity back here to, ha, aha, you know what, this is tried and true, but it hasn't been used in this way. And right. that was innovation. Right. Evolution was just the constant moving of this edge forward. Yep. Yep. In the technology timeline revolution was 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 so far out above that bleeding edge the leading edge became the bleeding edge and innovation was backfilling into uh new ideas 
uh, new applications of old ideas. So in that context, I'll take yep. it. Yeah, there you go. And so that's perfect, right? And uh, and look, I'm living that dream right now with my current role. I, I, I am applying methodologies and processes and technologies from a completely disparate industry into a new industry that I have zero experience in. And it's, and it's people like, Oh, what? 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 Okay. Wow. Let's see if it works. And I don't know if it'll work, but let's, let's apply some different thinking to what we're doing and where we're trying to get to. Right. That synthesis, as someone said down here, the synth synthesis of things that you know that work in one place, let's 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 incrementally test them in another place. And I and I think to sort of circle it back to your game is that you know you've taken Lutman's CRT and adapted it to African uh, warfare in World War II, and that's cool. So and and it and it appears that it works. So so I that's think, goodness. I think it does. Yeah. So so. Not saying that just because it was my thinking. Uh, this was the third combat system, I, I, uh, I, a fourth one for the game. Uh, using the original one, trying a couple of other ones and saying, you know right. what, I like the idea of having morale, training, and hardware define how things work. Right. Well, it's yeah. very pretty. And, and you need those. And yep. so often they were abstracted away, so all you're seeing is just sick. I want to show how you got to six. Yeah, I, I, I've got, I can't I can't put the counter up because I'll get yelled at because I it was a, someone sent it to me for complimentary. I, but you know, th there's some guys that have a six. Okay, <laughs> um, it means what to me relative to the other guys? I don't know. Now, I, I, so I'm going to do this one time only, be, only because John Cranes is watching, and I'm feeling the heat. But he's asking, uh, what is Chris's next project? So it's kind of like a, that's kind of like a softball, right? So you yeah. got thirty, se you got thirty seconds. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm doing a uh, Operation um, Crusader variation of the same system. Uh, it's set six months earlier in the winter. So the winter battles uh, in the desert, just to the east of this area, I mean, Tobruk was being held by the Australians and the Poles and um, the um, the Italians had uh, cordoned it off, and the Germans still had their same two tank divisions in there, trying and, and using earlier technology, tried to uh, take Tobruk, couldn't do it. The British counterattacked all the way from the uh, Egyptian border. It was quite a hike. Swirling tank battles, a lot of um, unknowns, mm -hmm. but ebb and flow, chaos. This system's perfect for it. The... Um, and that game is also going to be coming out with uh, with Compass. I've, I've got a couple of other games in the pipeline. Um, don't have the publisher uh, identified specifically right now, but they're going back to my favorite NATO Warsaw Pact topic, uh, fighting in, in, in Germany. And uh, these, these are battalion-level games. These are all an outshoot of a game project that started out... Um, 20 years ago, I've counted it out, and um, it's morphed into, um, it, it's a spin off of the Flashpoint Go On game of Mark hmm. Hunt. With his, oh, okay. his encouragement and blessing, I've taken that to Germany, which is where he originally had the concept for the game. Huh. But then the Berlin Wall fell, and, and it a Soviet, uh, you know, NATO Warsaw Pact game topic became kind of passe. Well, it's become the thing again. And uh, so I've got a few games on that system that uh, I've got ready to go. A couple, two games on the system ready to go. Uh, just polishing up some order battle work on one. Cool. Which is the Hungarian and Soviet attack on the capital of Croatia, getting into Yugoslavia. And the other one on the... Uh, uh, fight through the full gap down to Frankfurt and to the Rhine, the old classic attack yeah. there. I'm planning yeah. on doing some more in that in Germany. They're not the maps are not going to made up. It's not going to be another attempt at the uh, the Central Front series, uh, but it right. was it was derived from some effort to 
hey, look, the map scales are the same. I wonder if you could play this game on those maps. That's how that started. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that, that, so that's interesting. I'd be, be curious to see. There's a lot of good research that's been done on order of battle and maps and things yeah. like that. So you could probably reference a lot of other, a lot of newer designers that are doing some really good stuff versus some of the, some designers that are just kind of making their OBs up going, oh, well, let's pretend that Russia did something really fabulous with their economy and everyone has a T80 now. So there's, there's a lot of that sort of nonsense around as well. Uh, but that's so be it. It's a game. We'll, we'll play it maybe. Um, well, thank you, Chris, for uh, spending the time and uh, sharing the story here. I think, I think you got me over the hump. I think I'm going to go get the pre-order in. Uh, so, so well done. Um, yeah, there you go. What, one more, right? Uh, okay. John Cranes is going to have to write another check to you now. So uh, we'll I'm hey, kidding, John. It's, it's okay. all fun. You know, I, I'm doing this not because uh, I'm ready to retire and this is my retirement income. Right. right. Retirement income, unfortunately, is going to be selling off my uh, my inventory and, and living off the proceeds. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. There you go. Well, this is great. Great chatting with you, mate. It's nice. It's nice to get into this. I appreciate the time, Ken. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All the best.